And now, a show with inappropriate language, The Power Movement. Welcome to The Power Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week, well, my life completely sucks right now. And my problems are all first world problems. So really, I'm just bitching about my life for intro material, but it really does affect my performance, so I'm telling you. It's home improvement time at my house, and like most non-practicing but bar mitzvah Jews, I am not very good at these types of projects. But this time, the work shouldn't be that hard. The bulk of it was painting, and while most of you don't know this, my junior year in college, I was the manager of a AAA student painter's branch, which means I painted $40,000 worth of houses in a summer and I should be good at painting. But really, I didn't do shit that summer. I hired a bunch of people to work for me, and I hung out with my girlfriend and carried a pager so workers could get in touch with me if any emergencies came up. So while that job should have prepared me for this project, it didn't. Our goal was to paint two rooms, build a bunch of furniture, and get new beds. And the painting part went really smooth. We got to a point where we have two white rooms that are 98% painted, and when it's time for touch-ups, my dumbass picks up the wrong paint bucket, and all the spots I touched up are now off white. My wife points it out, and I say the paint is just wet and it'll dry white. And go figure, I'm wrong again, which means we have to put on another coat. That's kind of par for the course for me in these kind of projects. But the biggest issue with this whole project is the bed situation. We get the rooms painted, we build our kid's new bed and death set, and give him the two-year-old queen bed that we had, and we are upgrading to a heavenly bed from the Westin. This is a huge purchase for us, and we already know we're going to love this bed, so we're stoked. The problem is that it takes over a month to get the bed, and we ordered it the day we broke down and sold my kid's loft bed. So that means my wife is sleeping on the couch, and I'm on an air mattress in my office, and it'll most likely be another three weeks before we have a bed. I feel it every morning when I wake up at 5 a.m. because too much light is coming through my aluminum foil covered window. I could go on and on about this, but really, I can't believe I'm complaining about this. Especially now, at a time when so many people have it so much worse than me. Like, they might not even have an air mattress to sleep on. So while my project sucks, especially the waiting part, it's going to be awesome. Which is pretty similar to the experience I had lining up my guest this week, Greg Nelson an OG pro wakeboarder who runs the show over at Hyperlight. I met Greg almost a decade ago at a wakeboard event I was on the mic for. He seemed like a cool dude, and he's also a living legend in wakeboarding. So when I started this podcast, I lined him up as a guest to be on the show. That was almost four years ago. From there, I did the research and then started following up with emails for a few years. A lot of emails. Most of the time, I would get a reply from Greg, We'd go back and forth about scheduling, and then he would ghost me and the interview never happened. I was getting frustrated, and in my mind, Greg Nelson was starting to suck. Instead of hating him behind his back, I sent him an email that said this would be my last one. I mentioned that we had been talking about doing this podcast forever, and at this point, while I judge people on their word, I didn't think his was good anymore. He got back to me right away and was like, Mike, I am so sorry. I've been an ass to you, and I don't want to do this. That's not the type of guy I am. Name the date and time, and we will get it done. And that's what happened. And what I learned from the whole situation is that the people I interview, they don't need me. They don't want me. I want them. And even though there can be a shit ton of delays, if they give you their word that they're going to do an interview, and they're a good person, it will eventually happen, and it will be awesome. Before I get into my chat with Greg, which was totally worth the wait, I want to ask you to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you listen to me on. Follow me on Instagram at the Powell Movement and shoot me an email with any questions, suggestions, or feedback. My email is mike at thepowellmovement.com and I will get back to you. Finally, I want to ask you to support my amazing sponsors. They are Stanley, Peter Glenn Sports, and the 10 Barrel Brewery. Now, let's talk to Greg Nelson. When I talk to people about you, you're all about Seattle sports. And some would say that you could almost be an asshole when it comes to Seattle sports. Would you agree with that? A (laughs) hundred percent. What does that even mean? Have you ever gotten in a fight that was centered around team sports? While I'm sure you wouldn't do it now at this age, but in your 20s when you're drunk at a bar and someone says the Seahawks suck, what does that do to Greg Nelson? 
Well, it never led to fisticuffs, but you know, amongst the wakeboard community, we have a lot of different fans of different teams. So, you know, if I have banter going back and forth between Don at Liquid Force or anybody else in the industry, they know where my heart lies. And most of it's just to have good fun. Growing up in Seattle, did you get to go see like Kenny easily kill people at the Kingdom and stuff like that? I did. My family growing up had tickets to the Kingdom, season tickets. And then once CenturyLink was brought online, my family's kept a couple season tickets ever since that. So it's been fun. You know, we get to go to at least a couple games a year, whether it's with my dad or somebody from the Hyperlight office. Tommy and I have gone quite a bit. And then CJ, kind of the head man there at Hyperlight HO, he goes with us as well, too. So they've been good memories for what parts of it I do remember, because we've definitely kind of gotten loose at some of those games. Oh, for sure. And with these podcasts, I like to know how everybody grew up and knowing that you had season tickets to the Seahawks, I'm sure you weren't totally poor by any means, but was it rich, poor, average? What does your dad do? What kind of upbringing did you have? It was, I would say, pretty well off. By the time I was in sixth grade, my parents had bought a house on Lake Sammamish. And that's kind of what introduced me to the lake life. You know, at that time, there was no Microsoft. It was a lot more reasonable to get onto the lake. And moving out to Issaquah at that time, you know, Issaquah was still rural almost. I think there's a Lowe's now where there used to be a drop zone and we would watch hot air balloons and just, it was Issaquah before Seattle really blew up tech-wise. And even before Seattle blew up music-wise, before Seattle was anything, people didn't think about it, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I cherish those memories. You know, went to a Catholic school, uh, Eastside Catholic, and there were a few other friends of mine that lived on the lake there. So we kind of had a, you know, a little crew to go out and water ski with or wakeboard eventually when that came online. I was definitely fortunate growing up, thanks to all the hard work that my parents put in to, to provide that. Yeah, opportunity is sweet. And given that you live right on the lake, is it something that from like May to October, you're able to go almost every day after school if your dad's willing to take you out? Yeah. Once I had caught the bug for doing everything behind the boat, I think that we rode as early as April with wetsuits. And then later on, as my career got going, we would ride as late as October again with wetsuits. But at that time, the fall was always the best water conditions because because most people had packed up for the summer. The water was still relatively warm and fall in the Northwest is one of the best times. So looking back, I think the fall riding was some of my favorite. And now that you live in Texas, I would think that your affinity for cold water has to be zero right about now. When you come back up here, is there any thought of getting in the water if you have a meeting with Hyperlight in late September? Or are you just scared of the cold water nowadays? I typically don't jump in when it's super cold. And to be honest, when I'm up there for meetings or doing any kind of work at our headquarters, the light stays out so late that we typically will grab our golf clubs after work and go try to fit in 9 or 18 and just enjoy all the other sports that are so fun up there in Seattle area. Cool. And back to lake life, when was the first time you saw someone standing sideways? Oh, man. So I don't know that I ever saw it. I came home from a vacation with my family with a skimboard. And the first thing I did when I got home was I took off the fins of a pair of combo skis and drilled them into the bottom of the skimboard and started riding around on that. I'm not exactly sure, but I think at this time, the original scurfer was out there and I had ridden it, but it was so skinny that just waxing up the skimboard and using that behind the boat was more fun for me. And after that, it didn't take too long before we were trying to stand sideways on everything, whether it be on a kneeboard or borrowed a friend's windsurfer, kind of got used to that. And then before you know it, I think it was a second generation scurfer came online that was a little bit wider. And then Hyperlite had its first Hyper Pro that came out. So where I was fortunate as with all the water ski companies being based right there near Lake Sammamish, the minute something new came out, it wasn't that hard for me to get my hands on it and go try it. Okay. 
Were you snowboarding and skiing as well? Because Washington is also known for having a ton of snow in the mountains. And I would think snowboarding. I mean, this is all, I guess, around when you're first getting on that surfer. It's what, like 84, 85-ish? Yeah, it was. So snow skiing, yes, I did grow up snow skiing. But the minute that everything kicked for me, standing sideways, I switched to snowboarding and never looked back. And I remember days in the fall, like while going to school at the UW, where you could wakeboard in the morning, go to class, and then get up to the mountains, you know, up to Alpental for a couple hours in the evening. And that was pretty much my MO all the way through college. Even before you get to college, though, we've talked about Seattle sports, and I think you're a big dude all around. Did you play team sports as well, or was it strictly board sports? I did play team sports in high school. I played football for four years, and that was just a total blast. But at that time, I was not big. You know, I'm six foot. I think at the time in high school, I might have weighed 180 pounds or something like that. So I was one of the smaller guys on the field, but I was able to play all four years. And the only injury that I ever got, it was jet ski related, (laughs) breaking a toe. That's the only thing that really kept me out of any football play during that time. Okay. So you're in high school and a big thing around then is music. I mean, Seattle was put on the map probably your junior, senior year of high school, I would think, with music just exploding here. And were you into that scene at all? Did you check out any of the shows that were going on? You know, it took me a couple years after it really kicked to get into that. I never got to see Nirvana or Pearl Jam. I saw some of the smaller bands when I was in college. One of my roommates was really influential for me with regards to music and exposing me to Soundgarden and I can't remember all the names right now, but it was fun to grow up at that time as the Seattle scene was just kind of bustling. But my focus was really sports. So while I was listening to the music, I wasn't really downtown going to a lot of shows. Gotcha. I mean, in the high school kind of breakfast club type click, would you fit into the jock category at that time with like a board sports asterisk next to it? Yeah, it was weird. Like I, I definitely rolled with that click, but I never really felt at home. And it was just because of the friends that I had had at the time. Looking back, I really didn't find myself till like second year in college where I actually started to meet some people in the snowboard and and wakeboard scene. With college for you, you go to UW, which is the local college. And do you go during the championship years or the championship year? My freshman year was the national title year. And I did go down to the Rose Bowl that year as a freshman. And was that one of the bucket list events in life that you would think, like your college wins the national championship and you're there? You know, I think at the time, it was my first year in college. I thought that was normal. (laughs) Looking back on it now, yeah, total bucket list. But at the time, I don't think I appreciated that just because it was my first year of being a student at the stadium at UW and then being able to get the Rose Bowl tickets and make that trek down to L.A. with your buddies. That was pretty cool. And I can imagine it was a time where there was just so much irresponsible drinking. I know because I was coming up at that point, too. It was a different time, I feel like. Weed was the drug that isn't accepted like it is today. So back then, if you smoked a lot, you were almost a druggie, and it wasn't cool with everybody. Was that kind of like how it was here in the Northwest, or was it different? I would say that accurate. You know, drinking was really prevalent all through high school and obviously into college. You know, the weed game, I wasn't really exposed to it until diving really, really heavy into action sports at the time, which for me was really, my influence came from the snowboard culture. You know, meeting at the time, they were my heroes, but like Sean Farmer, Nick Parada, some of the really old school, big mountain snowboard riders. Legends. Yeah, super legends. And then eventually, you know, you started working with the guys at FLF Films and got to meet a lot of the snowboarders. That was kind of my, I guess, influence when I look at my wakeboarding. And we are going to talk about Fall Line Films, but there's one more thing about college that I have to talk about. You were in a fraternity at a time when fraternities could get away with a lot more shit than they can get away with today, I feel like. What was the worst part of your hell week? Shit, I think I got drunk during the, you know, the first quarter and took a piss outside the fraternity and I got called out for that, which was during hell week, you know, they really call you out for things that you did that was stupid or, you know, that you weren't thinking. So that was probably the most, but my dad went to the same fraternity. And 
at the end of Hell Week, he was there as we were initiated into the fraternity. And I lived there for my freshman year and then sophomore year, moved back to Lake Sammamish with a group of guys and just commuted over to the university. Yeah, because I would think in college, you've got a fraternity, you've got partying, you've got classes, but you're trying to get as much time on the water as you possibly can, too, I would think. And I'm sure you're progressing really quick because I don't know if it's a first sponsor or you get flowed with boards, but K2 is a local company as well, and they make wakeboards back then. How do you get on a K2 board? So the guy that headed that up, his name was Blake Lewis. And it was kind of his baby at K2. And Blake also lived on Lake Sammamish. So just mutually meeting out on the lake, he approached me about trying this new shape that was actually shaped by Tony LaGosh down in, I think, Hood in in Oregon. And just through that meeting out on the lake, that developed into me getting a small ride with K2. There was a small salary there, which kind of met my job requirements while I was going to school. So I had a little bit of income and it allowed me to focus on just school and wakeboarding. And then Blake eventually left K2. And in that process, the wakeboard thing kind of fizzled out, but he got me on at O'Neill wetsuits because he he left K2 and went to O'Neill. And then he stayed in the industry for quite a while longer, but it was really working with him at the beginning that kind of got me connected into the right circle. Yeah, I mean, K2 wasn't really a big part of your career, but it really was at the same time. You mentioned Fall Lion Films. They were huge back then. K2 was working with them, and you end up in the seminal snowboard movie Roadkill. That right there is where you meet a lot of your heroes in snowboarding, just part of the whole Roadkill crew. And what does that do for wakeboarding, and what does that do for you as a person, being able to hang out with dudes that you've just seen in magazines? Oh, man, it was crazy. It was surreal. You know, we went down and we filmed a promo video for the K2 wakeboard. And that was done with Artie and Dave CM all line at the time. And so Farmer was there because he was just hanging out. Nick Parada was there because they wanted the K2 guys in the promo video for the wakeboarding as well, because Nick and, and Sean were their biggest athletes. So I don't even know if I can remember what it felt like, but I do remember when I got in the mail a copy of Roadkill. I had no idea that that footage was going to land in the movie. So I had already watched Riders on the Storm and Critical Condition and all the banging snowboard videos at the time. So immediately pumped that thing in the VCR. And in the opening intro song, a clip of me shows up. I was speechless at the time, but I was with some friends who were all big time snowboarders and, you know, had skate backgrounds. And so they were shaking me like, holy shit, you're in this thing. And, you know, we watched and then it got to my little section. And that's really what got me started. I mean, without that, I probably never would have made the rest of the connections in the snowboard or action sports world. And it'd probably be too many of them to list people that I met that were a part of my career that all happened because of landing in that movie. Yeah, I mean, there was no real media for wakeboarding back then. It was run by a bunch of water skiers who probably didn't do anything that any of the riders wanted at that point. But you didn't even really look at it like an industry, I would think, because it was so new. And then the first big, more mainstream than anything footage out in a movie. And it's so big for the sport, I would think, just getting the cool kids who are snowboarding aware that you can do it on a boat. Yeah, you're right. There was no magazine. There was no website. There was nothing for wakeboarding. And Fall Line Films really filled that niche. So they had shown wakeboarding, I think it was in Riders on the Storm with Eric Schmaltz. And then they included it in Dave's project, Roadkill. From there, I got offered to teach at the summer school down at High Cascade on, what is that, Mount Hood? Yep. And then my job wasn't teaching snowboarding, but it was driving a busload of kids down to Lake Billy Chinook on the east side of the mountains there, four or five days a week if kids wanted to wakeboard. So I was immediately in a position where I could teach kids to wakeboard, show them what's possible, and I hope helped grow the sport at the time. You're thrust into a position of being like an elite level pro athlete just through that, it almost seems like. When you go to a camp like that, you're the wakeboard dude there. Right. And I was the only one, right? And at the camp, All the snowboarders at the time were there. I knew their names, you know, and 
made friends with some of them, of course, and sometimes they would roll down the hill with me too and enjoy a break from the mountain and get out on the lake. So it was a really cool time. And around then too, I think around 92-ish, the pro wakeboard tour starts up. Does that help do anything to legitimize wakeboarding to the old school water ski heads or is it still just like kind of a laughable side sport? I think to the water skiers, yeah, it was just a little side sport that would probably be a fad for a couple of years. But for the wakeboarders, it was big because the events were well attended. People really enjoyed seeing the guys hit the wake and do tricks. I was never much of a competitor. It just wasn't my thing. And just like anything, when it starts, you have a lot of kinks to work out. And when the tour started, you had to like write down your trick list before you went out there and rode. <laughs> And so it was just really run kind of like a water ski event where there wasn't a lot of creativity. You weren't rewarded for spins or stylish grabs. You were rewarded for doing an invert because that's what water skiers thought was the hardest thing. Yeah. And that always happens when old people who don't get it are involved in a sport and eventually that gets pushed out. And we're going to talk about that. But you're also in college at this time. You study geography. Is there any real plan or is that just what you fell into? (laughs) my goal was to graduate. It didn't matter what I had, but I had to get my college education. And because I was so focused on wakeboarding in freshman and sophomore year, I was just dicking around with the classes I was taking. Mm -hmm. So when I went to declare for my major, I was like, oh, I want to go into the business school. And I didn't do any prerequisites to get into that school. So my advisor, which I never saw freshman and sophomore year, finally, they were like, look, if you're just trying to get your degree and get out of here, you can get into the geography and arts and sciences path and still get out of here in close to four years. You just wanted the piece of paper, which is what a lot of people want, and you got it, so that's great. But K2 eventually comes to an end. The next big brand you're a part of is O'Brien. It's another local company that really changed the whole wakeboard world with the Hyperlight board I think they put out back then. How does that relationship start? Is that another one on Lake Sammamish because that's where they keep their boat? Yeah, well, by this time... I was really motivated to make this my career, follow up on my passion. So as K2 fizzled, I talked to everybody. I talked to Hyperlight at the time. And Hyperlight was actually, at this time, was still HO skis. It was not Hyperlight. They had a board called the Hyperlight. That was as far as it went. It wasn't a separate brand. O'Brien, that was a totally different company. Oh, yeah. They had a big cocaine issue that kind of screwed that company, right? Yeah, and it still survived. And then when all that stuff got kind of settled out, Herb came back and started HO Skis. And then eventually that led to the creation of Hyperlight. Okay. But I was knocking on the doors all around Redmond, met the guys at O'Brien. I think the way that that really worked out was because I was on O'Neill at the time and I had been doing some promotional trips for O'Neill with some of their reps, their rep in Texas was also the O'Brien rep. And I did some work with him down in Austin, and he was the one that kind of got the ball rolling for me at O'Brien. It was great. It was a huge step up for me as far as contract pay, and that was probably junior year of college. I think it lasted for just a year, but it was a great job for me, and it kept me building relationships, kept me on the water, kept me progressing. I got to shape Not fully, but I got to have input on O'Brien's first twin tip board. And this is after the Flight 69 came out. Everybody had, you know, was going to get a twin tip. So I was involved in that process, which I learned a lot about shaping boards, which was fun. And it was, I think you'd see me on O'Brien in both spray and hit it. Okay. It was both of those. So it was a little bit longer than a year. Now it's time to take a sponsor break. And for the first time ever, I'm going to lead with beer and start with the Ten Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. I always go on and on about how Ten Barrel's roots are found in the mountains, skiing, snowboarding, biking, and how their mantra is drinking beer outside. I mean, Ten Barrel creates tons of events, puts out ski and snowboard movies each year that are legit. They sponsor an A-list group of athletes and cool shit like this podcast. They have always stayed true to who they are, and they get it when it comes to action sports. And of course, they make some amazing beers. So I want you to support the 10 Barrel Brewery. And to do that, it's pretty easy. Next time you're at the store, pick up a six pack of 10 Barrel and support the beer that supports you and me. You can find out more about all things 10 Barrel over at 10barrel.com. My next sponsor is Stanley. 
and your family has known them for over 100 years. They are the brand that invented the category of keeping beverages hot and cold. You may remember that green bottle that your grandpa kept his coffee in. Well, that's a Stanley, and they make so much more than that these days. I swear by the pint glasses and water bottles, and that's just the start of their product collection. For listening to this podcast, I'm going to save you 30% on all of Stanley's product collection. Here's what you need to do. Head on over to stanley-pmi.com, do some shopping, and when you check out, enter the code DRINKFAST, that's all lowercase, all one word, and you'll save 30%. Please buy something as Stanley is the best. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Videos are how wakeboarding is going to spread initially. People are going to wear out VHS tapes and spray gravity sucks. That's the first real big one I feel like that helps change things. The big thing about the movie is Gator and Byerly were hitting a double up at the end of the movie. No one was really doing that shit at that time. Was that a big shift in the sport for anybody to see that? And once they did, they were like, okay, we've got another whole level opened up here. It's funny because I was talking about this this last week with one of our team riders at Hyperlight. That winter, after Spray came out, all we did was watch the last two sections of Spray over and over and over again. And the minute that it was warm enough in the spring to get out on the water, all we were doing was trying to duplicate driving the double up and learning how to hit it. Before O'Brien even had a twin tip, all we were riding was a 69. Didn't matter who you were sponsored by or anything, just to have that twin tip board and a board that worked as well riding switch stance as regular. Yep. We all rode that until Neptune had one, O'Brien made one. They finally came out, but that section of Scott and Gator was probably the most influential for me personally out of anything. You, like those dudes, are innovators in a new sport, and that's huge right there. But the old guard, the water ski guys, while they do want to exploit you and profit off you, they really don't have a vision of what the sport's going to become. Like, they can watch the end of that movie and not see the double up and realize that that's going to change things, where anybody who's riding is going to figure that out. And how do the water skiers treat wakeboarders? Like, where HO makes skis as well, are you treated as an equal, or is it just like, here's this little fringe guy? totally fringe. And I think that there was a water skier in spray. And by water skier, I mean trick skier, somebody that could do all the flips on a board really easily from the trick ski world and just hop onto a wakeboard and do all those same inverts. But it looked like shit. Yeah. The stance was maybe 12 inches wide. There was no style. It's just like aerials. Yeah. Nothing appealing to me whatsoever with kind of a a snowboard style influence background. So does it get to the point where when they're putting guys like that in a video and they think it's cool and does it get to the point where the product doesn't meet what you need? And is that why you start double up because you just can't get the products you want? Or is it just they don't get it across the board? And that's why you've got to start your own business. There were good wakeboards on the market. That wasn't the issue. It was that these guys have no clue what's happening. They didn't look at wakeboarding as a lifestyle or as a real sport. It was like you said, that little fringe thing. So it was the marketing and the messaging that really drove us to start Double Up. And then because of the influence that Fall Line Films at the time had in action sports, you know, I started that with Artie and Jerry. That's how the whole thing came together. They built all these amazing snowboard films and watched the success of the Burton Sims Lamar, you know, all those brands just blowing up at the time, but they didn't really get a piece of that pie. They were just making films. And so for them, it was like, shit, if we're going to be making these films and they love to wakeboard themselves, we need to have a piece of the action. And so it was kind of like a a no brainer to start double up because I was the athlete, the product designer, kind of the lead messaging guy. And then we had this amazing marketing apparatus in film with Fall Line and Jerry and Artie's creativity. And I think it was just the ability to send a wakeboard message out from actual wakeboarders, not from water ski companies that thought it was some fringe thing. When you let your sponsors know and the rest of the industry know that you're going to start this rider-driven company and it's going to be better than anybody else out there, because I'm sure when you're doing it, there's got to be a little ego of like, hey, we're the riders, this is rider-driven, and this is why we're going to be better than everybody. Do the big brands look at you like, good luck, kid? 
actually, when we started, we got a lot of compliments. The guys at Hyperlite, they felt our impact probably more than other brands, just because we were based in Northern California. It was a huge wakeboard market at the time. So they were very complimentary of what we were doing and how we were doing it. And you got to remember that I was talking to all these people about producing our boards because I didn't have a manufacturing background. So whatever we did, we had to find a place to make our boards for us and then go resell them. You know, we never had manufacturing. So at the time, I don't know if you remember a company called Full Tilt. Yeah. They made boards for us for a year. They make ski boots now. Yeah. And finally, where we got the best manufacturing quality was, was out of Denny Kidder's manufacturing, which at the time was Kidder skis and eventually blindside wakeboards. So they were very complimentary too, because they're watching the units come through that they're making for double up. And I don't think that blindside even came close to it. So for the most part, people were genuinely happy to see it succeed because it was a cool story. And it probably would have lasted longer had we just been a little bit later in doing the project, because the minute that overseas manufacturing came online, that would have helped double up tremendously with margins and making sure that you have the profit out of the board to really pour back into the company. Yeah. I mean, at this point, when you're manufacturing through somebody else here, it's like you're almost like a marketing company that's like, hey, we're going to send you these specs, press these boards. We're going to sell the shit out of them. We're going to make them disappear. And then hopefully we'll come to another order with you next year where if you're working with a factory over there, it's so much cheaper, like you said. Is it one of those things where when you start the company, you put a ton of money into riders, athletes, and marketing, like a lot of athlete-owned businesses where you're just going to make the name and create a big splash and the sales come later? No, we did not. I was the rider. That was it. And my compensation from Double Up was minimal. All of ours was because we needed the company to grow and be profitable. So we did bring on other team riders, obviously kids that were just really attracted to the double up message and the product. You know, we had a really cool following and we ended up paying a couple athletes like Igor, Colin Wright, Rich Fasciano, some of the West Coast crew that were really influential at the time. But double up's entire message for the first four or five years was primarily me. And then Igor, and call and kind of work their way in. And we built programs around those guys as well. Eventually, you get it to the point where you're able to create the double up experience. And pretty much it's ahead of its time. It's a demo tour and a traveling experiential marketing event. That's like the buzzword of right now, although people can't do events because of the sickness. But you were doing (laughs) it in like 98, 99. And is that one of those ideas that just comes from your brain? Or is it something that you see another brand do? And you're like, we are going to be the traveling roadshow. God, you know, I think it was my brain, but I forget what my influences might have been at that time. You know, I was working with Nautique and they had their new boat. It was just a water ski boat, but it came with a wakeboard tower and all that kind of stuff. And I think it was obviously I needed to get out there and promote double up and go shake hands. So that was part of it. But I know that growing the sport was a huge focus back then, too, because we just needed more people to know that they could wakeboard. Yep. Kind of surprisingly, when it was pitched, it kind of took off on its own. And that's also because of team rider connections. At that time, we had signed Danny Harf and his sister, Lauren. And Danny's dad was a big executive at Planet Hollywood and the All-Star Cafe. Without that connection, the Double Up experience would have never gotten off the ground because Mr. Harf used his connections through the restaurants with Mountain Dew and, you know, a bunch of other things. And he was the one that actually put together a budget for us to go do this on year one. And that lasted for two years. And in that process, you know, we visited all the all-star cafe locations around. I mean, we actually drove the RV and boat into New York City to visit (laughs) that all-star cafe. That was pretty stressful. But we did appearances there. And in order to get the boat, I told Nautique I would visit their dealers regardless of whether or not they were a double up account. And obviously my goal was meeting these new dealers and trying to make them be a double up account. So it was really successful on that point of view, but it was terrible as far as my writing because we were just looking at a map and saying, okay, we'll do this one day. And then over here, we'll do that the next day. Not knowing that it was really an eight hour drive 
to get from A to B and knowing that you kind of have to wake up in a good mood and do the whole thing over again. So it literally was taxing. That whole summer was taxing. I don't think my riding progressed that much. You know, it was just a lot of work. Planning tours when you're 20 and you're just like, I'm going to go here, 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 and here. I'm sure if you were to do it now, the map would be out and you would make sure that, hey, we're only going to drive two hours and we're going to keep doing that instead of crisscrossing back and forth. I've done tours like that too, where it's really not fun when you realize what you've set yourself up for when you get out on the road. Yeah, it only took us a month before we figured out (laughs) what we had signed up for and we still had five months to go. (laughs) Obviously, we learned that year we didn't make as many mistakes scheduling years two, three, and four. But yeah, it was tough. And I remember after that first year, did the tour. We ended in September in Orlando so we could be at the trade show, Surf Expo at the time. And right after that, I was slated to go to Australia for a few weeks. And I was so spent that when I got to Australia, I couldn't even function. Luckily, the people that I stayed with were all friends of mine from past wakeboard travels, the Aussie Double Up crew. And they definitely helped cover for me. But after Australia, I was supposed to go to New Zealand. I called home and it was like, guys, I can't do it. So we ended up sending Colin Wright to New Zealand. And he was stoked. He was so thrilled to travel. And he did a great job for us on the New Zealand trip. And when I got home, I think I probably just stayed at home and slept for at least a week before I could get back into the office and function in any productive way. Yeah, I mean, it just sounds like you're wearing so many hats, too. It's not like you just go somewhere and show up and ride. You have to be the driver, the navigator, the guy selling in product to people that don't have it, the guy who's making sure you're taking care of all the deliverables. We've got to go to dinner at this cafe because we said we would six months ago. That, yeah, I can imagine (laughs) there's no rest whatsoever. And then you're going to have a good time at night, too. That's the celebration of each day, but then you have to do it all over again. Yeah, I can imagine it gets just like Groundhog Day miserable. Yeah. It did. I mean, I still am glad that we did it, but there were times where you just wanted to toss the handle and be done with the whole thing. Yeah, and I hate to bring up the worst part of that tour, but I think we have to just because it's part of your life and times. And in wakeboarding, I don't think you lose too many people, but it can happen. And on one of those tours, you lost Corey Kraut. He was riding without a life jacket. It looked like he knocked himself out and he passed. How do you get that news? Are you there? Or are you in the office. So how does that all happen? And I'm sorry to bring it up, but it probably still has a huge impact on your life. Yeah, it did. And honestly, I'm happy to talk about Corey anytime. I mean, just this past May, we celebrated his 20th anniversary of him being gone and and going up to heaven. But I hired Corey and Rich to come on the road with me in that year too, so that I could fly home and work in the office and take a break from the road. And the plan was that when I would leave, those two would run the show and they would also work in conjunction with our sales rep at the time. And so I thought I had everything, you know, dialed in. It was actually a Sunday and uh, I was with my friend and we were down in Reno, I think just bowling, you know, goofing off. And on the way back to the office, I got a phone call and the phone call just said, get to the office right now. And I was like, okay, you know, I don't know what it is. So when I got there, they told me what had happened. And I had to call Corey's mom and let her know. Uh, And the, the misery that followed for that, you know, that immediate two weeks was almost unbearable. You know, just because Corey was such a good person. And here he was out on the road doing something in a sense for me, right? I'm the face of the company. I own part of it. You know, he was out there working for me and didn't come home. Yeah. And at whatever age I was, was probably 26, 20, you know, I was really young at the time. You know, processing all that was a challenge to say the least. And it led to a lot of drinking and other stuff that I probably shouldn't be doing just to suppress the emotions. But it was difficult. Not much more I can say other than that it was, you know, it was a terrible time. And we still had to go out and finish that tour. Yeah. We had commitments made. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it doesn't just suck the fun out of wakeboarding for you, but just the fun out of all of life for you for probably like a year or so of just every day waking up like that really happened. Yeah. 
It was tough. Now it's time for my final sponsor break, and Peter Glenn Ski and Sports has their annual Labor Day sale starting Tuesday, September 1st, and it runs through Tuesday, September 8th. Peter Glenn has taken an additional 20% off thousands of items store-wide. But wait, there's more. As a thank you for listening to the Powell Movement, Peter Glenn is going to give you an additional 10% off sale items. To get the deal, head on over to peterglenn.com during the sale dates, find what you want, and when you check out, use the code TPMSALE, that's all caps and all one word, and you'll get an extra 10% off any item already on sale. Happy Labor Day from Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Now let's get back into the podcast. We'll get to some more bad stuff, but not as bad as that by any means. With Double Up in year four or five, it's supposed to be the break-even year, and you're delivering on what you said you were going to do. I mean, if you had a plan, I think you're selling through the boards that you thought you were, but the margins, like you say, aren't that great, and your investor wants more. Does he just come to you and be like, hey, man, I'm not going to be able to put some more capital into this because we're not making enough off of it? How does it work where you find out that there's going to be some rocky financial times ahead? So the investor was Austin Hurst, the Hurst family. Oh, wow. Like William Randolph Hurst? Yes. What a dick. He's got so much money. I know. He was also the investor in Fall Line Films, and that's how we got the whole thing started. Huh. So the relationship between Austin and Double Up was handled more through Artie and Jerry and then our CFO at the time, his name was Tim Runyard. And so he was the one managing the line of credit, obviously accounting for all the sales, costs, everything that go into the business. And it was fine. You know, at first we understood, but we had something started and we felt like we had something good started. So we started talking to other potential investors so that Austin could, you know, it was his right. It was his money. So he could get his money out of the business. And I don't think he wanted to deal with it. And I got to be honest, I think that the death of a team rider affected that from a liability perspective. You know, nothing ever came of that. I have to mention the Kraut family, Kelly and Nancy, Corey's mom, you know, as gracious as you could be in that situation they were. But I do think that it kind of scared Austin a little bit and I get it, you know, I'm not blind to that. And then at the time, Austin was also investing in other action sports stuff, whether it be snowboard event tours, Steve Astefin's The Family, which was an action sports agency at the time. I remember them, yeah. He was dabbling in a lot of different areas. So for a couple of years, we tried to find other investors and the right fit never panned out. And then finally, in like year five, there was an interested investor, but he was so clueless. He didn't know who I was. All he saw was my name on the payroll. And he was like, well, who's this guy? I've never met him. You know, everybody at the office is trying to work on this. I'm out on the double up experience. And so he really had no idea what my role in the company was. That's a big red flag. Yeah, huge. And the fact that he didn't know told me, why does this guy want to invest in wakeboarding? Right. So it came down to a really tough decision because we had an interested buyer. Obviously, the guy didn't understand what I did. So in his plans, he was like, well, we don't need that guy. I've never met him. So I think just with everything that had happened over like the six, seven year period of creating the idea, getting the business plan, taking it up to 2000 or 2001, it was kind of the end of the project for me. But it also continued on with the sales team, the accounting team. They did the best that they could with carrying on the name. And it wasn't five months after that I got the call and they're like, hey, uh, how do we do a new wakeboard? <laughs> <laughs> so there was some hard feelings, but I got over that stuff pretty quick. And even though I had taken on a new job, I still had a passion for wakeboarding. And then I ended up being a contractor for Double Up, helping them with new shapes, allowing them to continue to use my name on the boards, at least having an, an attachment to it, even though I wasn't running it, right? So. It definitely was a kind of a tricky time, but looking back, it's what needed to happen for Double Up to still continue. And the company is still operating out of Australia. And it's more known as DUP, DUP Wake, you know, which stands for Double Up. Yep. Out of all the companies that came and went 
in wakeboarding's early years, I do feel a sense of pride that Double Up still exists today. Was it the first rider-owned brand, at least a hard goods brand out there? Yeah. And so while you're still on contract, does that kind of essentially end your pro career as well? Yeah, that was that was the end of it. You know, without me at Double Up, the relationships with like O'Neill and Nautique and all these other guys, it was coming to an end, but it wasn't anything that I fought. I was like, hey, I get it. I'm moving on to a slightly different career path. And at that time, I could look at my own footage and my own riding and know that I wasn't at the top of my game. And I definitely wasn't at the top of where the sport was right now. So that part wasn't hard for me. I think my passion was more about the business side of it as much as it was about riding, actually. So when the business side of it came to an end for me, it wasn't that hard for me to give up the pro career side. Gotcha. So during your years as a pro rider, who were your big sponsors? Nautique, O'Neill, and Double Up. Were you able to make some pretty good coin? Because like, I think you, you'd marry your wife, Evelyn. You took some time off from wakeboarding and probably life. Were you able to just relax for a little bit and live on some wakeboard money and then figure out what to do in your next phase of life? Yeah, it all worked out for me pretty well in the end. I was compensated when I left Double Up for basically the right to use my name because my name was on every product. So it worked out okay. I had already purchased a house up in Truckee. You know, when Evelyn and I got married, we were living up there. We still wakeboarded with friends, like either down in Reno or going down to the Delta and, and we're wake surfing at that time. But we enjoyed the mountains because I never had that season where it was like, you know, 100 days on the hill. But during kind of the last few years of Double Up and the first few years of the next job, just chilling in Tahoe, newlyweds, it was a real blast. Nice. When you say the next job, you know, and looking at it on paper, when I see a pro rider who started his own brand then ends up in the retail world, it looks like a step backwards. But then when I think about it more, it's like, wow, he's going to learn a whole nother aspect of the business that he didn't have on the pro side and the brand side. How do you end up in retail? Well, at Surf Expo, the year that I was basically, I was there for the trade show as I was finding out that I had no future with Double Up. So I was only at the show for one day. And at the time, Cope McFeeders was by far the biggest wakeboard retailer on the West Coast. When I started with them, I found out that they were the biggest dealer that Hyperlite had anywhere. The volume that they did was absolutely mind boggling. And my position was one of managing all the different pro shops in all the different locations. I look back and I call that my master's degree in our sport because until you fully understand retail and how that works, you don't have a full picture of the scope of the business. So while it was a step back in my mind at times, as it got going, and I was able to base at home. I found for me, it was a joy, you know, because I wasn't on the road every day. And it was a job that was pretty easy in the sense that I knew so much about wakeboarding that it was right in my wheelhouse. Obviously, I had to learn all the ins and outs of retail and then setting up boat shows and sales and all that kind of stuff. But I wasn't disappointed at the time in any means. I had a steady paycheck. I was making a lot more than I did at Double Up. And I was still in the industry. You know, I was forming better relationships with Liquid Force, with Hyperlite, all the different brands, because we were probably the most attractive account in all of the country at the time. Yeah. So people are courting you almost. They want to do business with you as much as possible. Yeah. You get that background there. That whole gig keeps you connected with the whole side of the other business, the brand side. And I don't know what year it is, but I think the financial crisis happens. And eventually you end up over at Hyperlite where you've been forever, it seems like. But how does that happen? Does Hyperlite come to you and be like, hey, man, we know that you know every aspect of this business and we want you to work for us? Or is it something where you're ready to get out of retail and into the brand game again? It's weird. So like in 2006, 2007, by this time, I've been at Coke McFeeders for four years the relationship that I have with the entire Hyperlite team is top notch because we're their biggest account, right? So they were courting, they were schmoozing. But more importantly, I was talking to the right people. I knew CJ, Brian Gardner at the time, and the HO Hyperlite rep in Northern California, Joe. And he and I became just really good friends through all the work that we did together. So 
it also gave me a chance to sit back and really analyze every shape that was being put on the market. Whereas when you're with one brand, you really kind of are only seeing what that brand produces just because you don't have the time to look at every other board in detail. Yep. But in retail, I'm looking at everything and my wheels are still turning as far as weight board shapes go and product design. So even while I was with Coke McFeeders, they were okay with me contracting with Hyperlite to provide some shapes. And the first shape that we did was called the Tribute. And if you look at the Tribute, it was essentially the continuation of my pro model from Double Up. But at the time, Hyperlite's manufacturing was so advanced that I was able to shape things into the board that I couldn't have done anywhere else. And then I worked with Sean Murray on a new shape for him. And so there were two years where I was still employed at Coke McFeeders, but I was shaping boards for Hyperlite and I was in a position to buy those shapes for the retail operation. It was a pretty cool deal. That was in 07. So then 09 hit and I was just fortunate enough that there was a position for me at Hyperlite. And by that time too, the whole Ronix split happened. And so there was a need at Hyperlite for somebody that had the knowledge base that I did for the sport, whether it be product design or marketing or team management, whatever it was, right? There was a need there at Hyperlite. And after having that experience in retail, I was ready to go. And obviously getting back on the manufacturing side, you know, felt like the right step if retail could have been considered a step back, this was definitely a step forward. And I had known the guys at Hyperlite for so long that it wasn't anything that took me any time to get used to. We just hit the ground. If you look at it, you're the VP of sales and marketing at Hyperlite, which is a heavy title and probably one of the most important titles in wakeboarding. And when you think about Hyperlite now, you've been with them for, you know, 11 years or so and probably longer in contract work. What are the innovations that you've had your hand in that you're most proud of? Because there's sales and marketing shit, sure. But I would think to be able to shape the product that you're seeing the riders on, that has to have a personal meaning and gratification for you. Is there a couple products that mean the most to you? Yeah. And just one correction. My title is VP Marketing. Oh, sorry. We have a separate VP for sales. And the team that really operates Hyperlite is myself and then my partner, Tom Curtin. And Tom's responsible for developing the line, getting manufacturing going. And so at the top, it's him and I. And obviously, we have a big support cast that we work with as well, too. I think going back, like the Tribute, I was so proud of that board. And it did really well for Hyperlite. But where I was grateful was that Hyperlite could manufacture at quality the design features that I wanted to put into the board. And at the time, it was molded in fins that I was never able to do during the double up years, and then also really detailed top deck features. You know, when you look at a snowboard or skateboard, you couldn't shape anything into the top deck or even a surfboard. But with a wakeboard being molded, you had the whole upper deck you could design features into. And so I had a lot of fun with that side of it. The tribute, we kind of sculpted out the tip and the tail, really thin in the tip and the tail. So it was like really light swing weight, lighter than anything I'd ever done at double up in that sense. And then there were a couple boards where we designed like risers under the toe side of a wakeboard so that you got assistance when leaning onto your toe edge. Like a gas pedal? Yeah. For beginner intermediate riders. That was really fun too. I think though, if I look at all the stuff I've done with Hyperlight, working with Sean Murray, he and I had a great relationship prior to me ever being at Hyperlight. You know, he was on the scene when I was on the scene. So we filmed for Mayday together. There were a couple of road trips that we did together working for shared accounts, Double Up and Hyperlite. So we had a great relationship and getting to work with Sean and sharing ideas back and forth. That was really fun because he and I have the same basic philosophy when it comes to wakeboard shaping. And so it was a really easy match for us to sit down and design something cool. Nice. Well, at this point in the show, I have something that I like to call inappropriate questions. <laughs> I get someone that you know to ask three inappropriate questions. And this week, I got a desk jockey legend in wakeboarding to ask the questions. Actually, Don Wallace recorded these questions about three years ago, and I'm finally going to get to play them for you. And to tell you the truth, I don't even know what they are because I haven't listened to them in so long. So I am going to open up my iPad and I'm going to play you three questions from Don. And I hope they really get you uncomfortable, but I don't remember what Don did. Okay. Here's question number one from Don Wallace. 
I really hope that at the end of these, that these people I'm asking questions to don't end up hating me. Cause like at the ones last time with Aaron Grace, I got a little backlash from him, but anyway, yeah, Greg and I go back a long time. We compete against each other, but we've worked closely in the past and he's a great dude. So, uh, I'll just jump right into my question and, and I will preface this by saying I got a little help on some of these from some of his other friends. <laughs> so the first one is, and I don't actually know the answer to this, so I'm interested to hear it. Tell us the story about how your old girlfriend stole your car and you had to hire a private detective to find her. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> this is at the time before Double Up and I had traveled down to Hood for High Cascade, traveled down to Southern California with friends I met there and met a blonde girl and was totally smitten right off the back. And being young and stupid at the time, I asked her to move up to Seattle with me, which was not a good decision. So we were living together, but we were also living together in a house with a bunch of other people like McCaffrey and Liz at the time. And, you know, they're married today. And there were a couple other couples that kind of came and went from the house that we were in. So as I was about to graduate college, I knew that the last thing I was going to do was bring this girl with me down to Truckee as I'm starting this whole venture. So I had bought her a car just for use, and she kind of saw the writing on the wall or it had enough of me. And so she bailed. And the only way I could get the car back so that I could sell it and just make sure the title was clean was to hire a private investigator. I don't know where Don got that, but that's definitely uh, <laughs> an oldie. Did you get the car back? Yeah, everything got settled. Private investigator had to go get it and get the keys and get it back so that I could pay off the loan. All right, well, good one there from Don. We're going to go to question number two. All right, so the second question is, your wife, Evelyn, who I know pretty well, used to know her back in the day, she at one point posed nude in Playboy with her wakeboard. And I don't remember if Greg decided that he wanted to start hanging out with her after that or if they had already been hanging out before she was in Playboy. Whoa. <laughs> that is, oh, that's a good one. So I had met Evelyn in passing on the Double Up Experience. And actually, she got to hang out with Corey Kraut for a day before that tragedy. But then the fact that a female wakeboarder was in Playboy, that reverberated around the industry real quick. So my interest was piqued. I ended up meeting Evelyn at a wakeboard event after the magazine had come out down in Louisiana. And at that point, I was like a heat-seeking missile. Like I just wanted to court her and hang out with her. And so this was at the very tail end of Double Up. And so all of a sudden, if I knew she was competing somewhere, I'd go down there to represent Double Up. But my real motive was to be close to her and see if something could work out between us. Was she naked in Playboy? She was wearing risque lingerie. I would, I would put it that way. It wasn't like what you'd expect out of like a Playboy centerfold or anything. Not that I'm going to check, but do you know the month, year, and issue number? I would have to go look. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I saved the copy. It was one of their like their off editions, like Girls of Sports or something like that, kind of like a special issue. Yep. But I've still got the copy today. Nice. Well, not everybody can say that their wife is in Playboy. I am going to go with your final inappropriate question. Okay. All right. Keeping with the theme of things that happened a long time ago, I am curious to know why Greg Nelson's nickname in high school was Boner. <laughs> oh, <darn. laughs> Oh, man. Well, it's part of the reason I never kept in touch with anybody at high school. Like, <laughs> the minute I had found my niche in action sports, fuck, man, I didn't talk to any of those pricks at high school because I think it was on like the first day of freshman high school. A friend of mine from middle school in front of a bunch of people at high school called me Boner. And I had never heard it before. But freshman in high school, somebody hears that, it's stuck. And I had to live with that for four years. So oh. <laughs> it did a toll on me, but in a way it also helped motivate me so that when I was out of that scene, I was going full bore 100%, not to show that that wasn't my nickname, but to show that 
they all got it wrong. Did your parents know your nickname was Boner? Dude, it was so embarrassing. It was at a football awards banquet, and I think it was junior year, and I had earned most improved on the football team that year. And as the coach was giving the award, that was the name that he said. And (laughs) I had to stand up in front of my parents and go accept this. And so that was tough. It was tough. And I couldn't wait to get out of high school. And even one year after high school, I didn't stay in touch with anybody. Not one person. I had so much angst against that whole experience. Not of the whole high school experience, obviously, but in high school, it's more about your friends and social life and just growing up, right? Yeah. And so to deal with that was really tough. I can't imagine being called boner like 80 times a day. Yeah, it would really get old. And given there was a boner on like maybe the Wonder Years or some kind of show back then, but there's nothing ever cool about being called boner. Yeah. It was tough. I'm going to have to give Don some shit for bringing that one up, but he did his homework. Yeah. Well, if you ever need counseling for that, Don is available for you. That's inappropriate (laughs) questions. And when I look at your career, you've done it all. No one else can really say that they've done what you have. You've been the Grom. You've been the pro rider. You've been the first rider owned brand in the sport. You've worked retail. You've run marketing for big brands. And when Transworld was around, they said you were one of the most eight influential wakeboarders of all time. And it's really cool to hear your story. And I'm glad we were finally able to do this. So thanks for your time, man. Yeah, Mike. Thank you, man. It was fun. So that was time with Greg Nelson. And he's a good dude. Yeah, he strung me along. But since he felt bad about it, or he said that he felt bad about it, that's all water under the bridge with me. The dude is a legend, and he owes me nothing. But it's cool to get the the behind-the-scenes look at what wakeboarding was back then from a dude who has done everything you can possibly do in the sport. And wakeboarding continues to provide for Greg Nelson. While he still has plenty of years to go, Greg Nelson looks to be a true lifer in the sport. Now that I've interviewed Greg, I should mention that there are now only two people that have told me to my face that they would do the podcast, and these shows still haven't happened. But Kevin and Salema... I'll still reach out every once in a while, and I know you're just playing hard to get. That's the podcast for this week. I want to thank you for listening, ask you to review me on whatever platform you listen to me on. This only takes a minute to do, and it really does help the show grow, I believe, but I'm not really sure about that, and if it doesn't, who cares? I still like reading the reviews. Finally, the podcast seems to be gaining listeners each week, and it's perpetually growing. I want to keep doing this for a long time, And in lieu of COVID, it's really important that you support my great sponsors who make the show happen, and it's easy to do that. When you buy beer, make sure it's 10 barrel. When you buy a new water bottle or pint glass, go with the best and pick up a Stanley. And when you're shopping online, head on over to peterglenn.com. If they have the product, they will match the price you found elsewhere, and you will support the show with that. I appreciate you all for this and hope you liked the episode. Have a great week, everyone.